Well, friends, we're continuing in the book of Esther, and we're really at a critical moment here. Esther has decided to go to the king. There's the threat of potential disaster if she's considered unwelcome by the king, but let's read what happens in Esther 5. It says, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So all that worrying just in a moment, it came to nothing, and they were able to see, okay, this, this is actually all right. And sometimes that happens, doesn't it, in all of our lives. We're able to see, oh, that thing I was fretting about so much, it ended up actually being nothing. Well, there's still much more to, to go here. So Esther, now she has access to the king. The question is, well, what's your request? That's his question to her. And, and she has a simple request. She wants to actually um, have the king invite Haman. Remember, Haman is the enemy of the Jews. She wants him to invite Haman to a feast that, he's pre that she's prepared for the king. So there will be Esther, there will be the king, and Haman there right that very day. And he, he uh, agrees to that. And then at the feast, he says, well, what is your wish? In other words, he understands that there's something more here. This isn't just about having a feast, but again, she doesn't really tell him everything straight away. She, she then says to him, well, I want to be able to do the same thing tomorrow. I want you to come with Haman again to an, a, another feast. And, and uh, that's it, her request, but she says, and then I'll let you know what my real request is if we do this tomorrow. So that's the plan. And Haman, he's actually delighted. He feels he his exalted position and you know that he's in this special place right beside the king that the queen only wanted one other person there it was him and and yet as he makes his way home who does he see at the king's gate but Mordecai and Mordecai is he it says here he neither rose nor trembled before Haman so it, to someone who's so proud who demands really the worship of other people he, he can't tolerate this it's just too much for him. So he, he ends up, we're told, being filled with wrath against Mordecai. And then he goes home and he calls together his friends, his wife, and and they chat about everything that's gone on. He he reviews all the glorious things that are are happening in his life. Um, this, and and even mentions about this feast today and then tomorrow's feast and his special position there. And but then he says this. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Isn't that amazing? So someone who says, I have all these great things that have happened uh, to me, but I can't be happy unless this other guy is miserable or even more than that, unless he's dead or even more than that, unless all his people group are dead. Wow, this is a strange, strange hatred that he has. Now, at this point, his wife becomes his advisor because, see, what he said is, like, all these great things are happening, yet I have this one problem, and I don't know what to do about this Mordecai because, uh, he, it, you know, he knows he's got the decree of the king, but he has to wait several months for that to actually happen. So, now, what should I do now? So, his wife, Zeresh, she's kind of like a Jezebel. You know, remember Jezebel, uh, King Ahab's wife? And, and she says this, she's gonna be an advisor to him. She say, look, I, I know exactly what to do here. She says, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made in, in the morning, in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. That's the plan. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan from this Jezebel, this, this Zeresh. Uh, and then she said, go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman. So I thought this was good. He, he's so thankful he has this wife who gives him such good advice. You know, a gallows 50 cubits, that's 75 feet. That's a very tall gallows. And we'd have to say that that's quite discouraging. You know, if you're, if you're on the side of God's people and you see this gallows built in order to hang one of your leaders, well, that that's so discouraging, and it seems like it's a almost a monument to hopelessness. And yet, 
we know that this story turns out a lot better than this moment of hopelessness. And then we think of the story of the cross and think about that reality of the cross and even Christ on the cross. And we think, there's our hero. This, this can't be good. And yet something profoundly good was actually taking place there on the cross. Father, help us to wait with hope for the grand culmination of all things as those who know that a cross that looks only like disaster can actually end up being a great moment of glory even. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.